Fourteen days had already passed since we had come to Cholula, and we had nothing more to do there, for we saw that the city was again fully peopled, and we had established friendship between them and the people of Tlaxcala. But as we knew that the great Montezuma was secretly sending spies to our camp to inquire and find out what our plans were, our captain determined to take counsel of certain captains and soldiers whom he knew to be well disposed towards him, because he never did anything without first asking our advice about it. It was agreed that we should send to tell the great Montezuma, gently and amicably, that in order to carry out the purpose for which our lord and king had sent us to these parts, we had crossed many seas and distant lands, and that while we were marching towards the city as ambassadors that guided us by way of Cholula, where the people had plotted a treason with the intention of killing us, and we had punished some of those who intended to carry out the plot. As our captain knew that the Cholulans were his subjects, it was only out of respect for his person, and on account of our great friendship, that he refrained from destroying and killing all those who were concerned in the treason. However, the worst of it all is that the priests and caciques say it was done on his advice and command. This, of course, we never believed, that such a great prince as he is could issue such orders, especially as he had declared himself our friend, and we had inferred from his character that since his idols had put such an evil thought as making war on us into his head, he would surely fight us in the open field. But as we look upon him as our great friend and wish to see and speak to him, we are setting out at once for his city to give him a more complete account of what our lord the king had commanded us to do. When Montezuma heard this message and learned through the people of Cholula that we did not lay all the blame on him, we heard it said that he returned again with his priest to fast and make sacrifices to his idols, to know if they would again repeat their permission to allow us to enter into the city or no, and whether they would reiterate the commands they had already given him. The answer which they gave was the same as the first, that he should allow us to enter, and that once inside the city he could kill us when he chose. His captains and priests also advised him that if he should place obstacles in the way of our entry, we would make war on him through his subject towns, seeing that we had as our friends the Tlaxcalans, and all the Totonacs of the hills and other towns which had accepted our alliance, and to avoid these evils the best, most sensible advice was that which Wichilobos had given. When Montezuma heard the message which we sent to him concerning our friendship, and the other fearless remarks, after much deliberation he dispatched six chieftains with a present of gold and jewels of a variety of shapes, which were estimated to be worth over two thousand pesos, and he sent certain loads of very rich mantles, beautifully worked. When the chiefs came before Cortez with the present, they touched the ground with their hands, and with great reverence such as they use among themselves, they said, Malinche, our lord the great Montezuma sends thee this present, and ask thee to accept it with the great affection which he has for thee and all thy brethren. And he says that the annoyance that the people of Cholula have caused him weighs heavily on him, and he wishes to punish them much more in their persons, for they are an evil and a lying people, and that they have thrown the blame of the wickedness which they wish to commit upon him and his ambassadors, that we might take it as very certain that he was our friend, and that we could go to his city whenever we liked, for he wished to do us every honor, as we were valiant men, and the messengers of such a great king. But because we had nothing to be given to eat, uh, for everything has to be carried into the city by carriers as it was built on the lake, he could not entertain us very satisfactorily. But he would endeavor to do us all the honor that was possible, and he had ordered all the towns through which we had to pass to give us what we might need. Cortez received the present with demonstrations of affection, and embraced the messengers, and ordered them to be given certain twisted cut glass beads. Cortez gave the ambassadors a suitable and affectionate reply, and ordered the messengers who had come with the present to remain with us as guides, and the other three to return with the answer to their prince, and to advise him that we were already on the road. When the chief caciques of Tlaxcala understood that we were going, their souls were afflicted, and they sent a say to us to Cortez that they had already warned him many times that he should be careful what he was about, and should refrain from entering such a strong city where there was so much warlike preparation and such a multitude of warriors. For one day or the other we would be attacked, and they feared that we would not escape alive, 
and on account of the good will that they bore us, they wished to send ten thousand men under brave captains to go with us and carry food for the journey. Cortez thanked them heartily for their good wishes, and told them that it was not just to enter into Mexico with such a host of warriors, especially when one party was so hostile to the other, that he only had need of one thousand men to carry the tabusques and the baggage, and to clear some of the roads. They had once sent us the thousand Indians very well equipped. Just as we were ready to set out, there came to Cortez all the caciques and all the principal warriors whom we had brought from Sempuala, who had marched in our company and served us well and loyally, and said that they wanted to go back to Sempuala and not proceed beyond Cholula in the direction of Mexico, for they felt certain that if they went on, it would be for them and for us to go to our deaths. The great Montezuma would order them to be killed because they had broken their fealty by refusing to pay him tribute and by imprisoning his tax gatherers. When Cortez observed the determination with which they demanded permission, he answered that they need not have the slightest fear that they could come to any harm, for as they would go in our company, who would dare to annoy either them or us? And he begged them to change their minds and stay with us, and he promised to make them rich. Although Cortez pressed them to stay, and Doña Marina put it in the most warm-hearted manner, they never wished to stay, but only to return to their homes. When Cortez perceived this, he said, God forbid that these Indians who have served us so well should be forced to go. And he sent for many lords of rich mantles and divided them among them, and he also sent to our friend the Pat Cacique two loads of mantles for himself, and for his nephew the other great Cacique named Cuesco. We set out from Cholula in carefully arranged order, as we were always accustomed to do, and arrived that day at some ranchos standing on a hill about four leagues from Cholula. They are peopled from Huichotzingo, and I think they are called the ranchos of Iscalpan. To this place soon came the caciques and priests of the towns of Huichotzingo, which were nearby, and people from other small towns, which stand on the slopes of the volcano near their boundary line, who brought us food and a present of golden jewels of small value, and they asked Cortez to accept them, and not consider the insignificance of the gift, for the good will with which it was offered. They advised him not to go to Mexico, as it was a very strong city, and full of warriors, where we should run much risk. They also told us to look out, if we had decided upon going, for when we had ascended to the pass we should find two broad roads, one leading to a town named Chalco, and the other to another town called Tlamanalco, both of them subject to Mexico. That the one road was well swept and cleared as to induce us to take it, and that the other road had been closed up, and many great pines and other trees had been cut down, so that horses could not use it, and we could not march along it. The little way down the side of the mountain, along the road that had been cleared, the Mexicans, thinking that we must take that road, had cut away a piece of the hillside, and had made ditches and barricades, and that certain squadrons of Mexicans had waited at that point so as to kill us there. So they counseled us not to go by the road which was clear, but by the road where the felled trees were, saying that they would send many men with us to clear it. Cortez thanked them for their counsel, and said that with God's help he would not abandon his march, but would go the way they advised him. Early the next morning we began, and it was nearly midday when we arrived at the ridge of the mountain where we found the roads, just as the people of Wichotzingo had said. There we rested a little, and began to think about the Mahican squadrons on the entrenched hillside, where the earthworks were that they had told us about. Then Cortez ordered the ambassadors of the great Montezuma who came in our company to be summoned, and he asked them how it was that those two roads were in that condition, one very clean and swept, and the other covered with newly felled trees. They replied that it was done so that we should go by the cleared road which led to a city named Chalco, where the people would give us a good reception, for it belonged to their prince Montezuma, and that they had cut the trees and closed up the other road to prevent our going by it, for there were bad passes on it, and it went somewhat round about before going to Mexico, and came out at another town which was not as large as Chalco. Then Cortez said that he wished to go by the blocked-up road, and we began to ascend the mountain with the greatest caution, our allies moving aside the huge thick tree trunks with great labor, and some of them still lie by the roadside to this very day. As we rose higher it began to snow, 
and the snow caked on the ground. Then we descended the hill and went to sleep in a group of houses which they build like inns or hostels where the Indian traders lodge. And we supped well, but the cold was intense. And we posted our watchmen, sentinels, and patrols, and even sent out scouts. The next day we set out on our march, and about the hour of high mass, I arrived at a town, Amekameka, where they received us well, and where there was no scarcity of food. When the other towns in the neighborhood heard of our arrival, people soon came from Chalco and from Chimaloacan and from Ayotzingo, where the canoes are, for it is their port. All of them together brought a present of gold and two loads of mantles and eight Indian women. The gold was worth over 150 pesos. And they said, Malinche, accept these presents which we give you, and look on us in the future as your friends. Cortez received them with great goodwill, and promised to help them in whatever they needed, and when he saw them together, he told them that Padre de la Merced to counsel them regarding matters touching our holy faith, and that they should give up their idols. Cortez also explained to them about the great power of our Lord the Emperor, and how we had come to right wrongs and to stop robbery. When they heard this, all these towns that I have named secretly, so that the Mexican ambassadors should not hear them, made great complaints about Montezuma and his tax gatherers, who robbed them of all they possessed, and carried off their wives and daughters, and made the men work as though they were slaves, and made them carry pine timber and stone and firewood and maize, either in their canoes or overland, and many other services, such as planting cornfields, and they took their lands for the service of the idols. Cortez, backing up again to the same point, Cortez comforted them with kindly words, which he knew well how to say to them through Doña Marina, but added that at the present moment he could not undertake to see justice done them, and that they must bear it a while, and he would presently free them from that rule. The caciques replied, We are of opinion that you should stay here with us, and we will give you what we possess, and that you should give up going to Mexico, as we know for certain it is very strong and full of warriors, and they will not spare your lives. Cortez replied to them with a cheerful mien that we had no fear that the Mexicans or any other nation could destroy us, and as we wished to start at once, he asked them to give him twenty of their principal men to go in his company, and they brought us the twenty Indians. Just as we were starting on our march to Mexico, there came before Cortez four Mexican chiefs sent by Montezuma, who brought a present of gold and cloths. After they had made obeisance according to their custom, they said, Malinche, our lord the great Montezuma, sends you this present, and says that he is greatly concerned for the hardships you have endured in coming from such a distant land in order to see him, and that he has already sent to tell you that he will give you much gold and silver, and Cholchubites as tribute for your emperor, and for yourself and the other Teus in your company, provided you do not come to Mexico, and now again he begs as a favor that you will not advance any further, but return whence you have come, and he promises to send you to the port a great quantity of gold and silver and rich stone to that king of yours, and as for you, he will give you four loads of gold, and for each of your brothers one load, but as for going on to Mexico, your entrance into it is forbidden, for all his vassals have risen in arms to prevent your entry, and besides this, there is no road thither, only a very narrow one, and there is no food for you to eat and he used many other arguments about the difficulties to the end that we should advance no further. Cortez, with much show of affection, embraced the ambassadors, although the message grieved him, and he accepted the present, and said that he marveled how the Lord Montezuma, having given himself out as our friend, and being such a great prince, should be so inconstant, that one time he says one thing, and another time sends toward the contrary, and regarding what he says about giving gold to our lord the emperor and to ourselves, he is grateful to him for it, and what he sends him now he will pay for in good works as time goes on. How can he deem it befitting that being so near to his city we should think it right to return on our road without carrying through what our prince has commanded us to do? His lord Montezuma had sent his messengers and ambassadors to some great prince such as he himself 
and if, after nearly reaching his house, those messengers whom he sent should turn back without speaking to the prince about that which they were sent to say, when they came back into his, Montezuma's presence, with such a story, what favor would he show them? He would merely treat them as cowards of little worth. And this is what our emperor would do with us, so that in one way or another we were determined to enter his city, and from this time forth he must not send any more excuses on the subject, for he... Cortez was bound to see him, and talk to him, and explain the whole purpose for which we had come. And this he must do personally. Then, after he understood it all, if our presence in the city did not seem good to him, we would return whence we had come. As for what he said about there being little or no food, and not enough to support us, we were men who could get along even if we have but little to eat. And we were already on the way to a city, so let him take our coming in good part. As soon as the messengers had been dispatched, we set out for Mexico, and as the people of Huichotzingo and Chalco had told us that Montezuma had held consultations with his idols and priests, who had said he was to allow us to enter and that then he could kill us, and as we are but human and feared death, we never ceased thinking about it. As that country is very thickly peopled, we made short marches and commended ourselves to God and to Our Lady, His Blessed Mother, and talked about how and by what means we could enter the city and it put courage into our hearts to think that as our Lord Jesus Christ had vouchsafed us protection through past dangers, he would likewise guard us from the power of the Mexicans. We went to sleep at a town called Itzapalatengo, where half the houses are in the water and the other half on dry land, and there they gave us a good supper. The great Montezuma, when he heard the reply which Cortez had sent to him, at once determined to send his nephew named Cacamatzin, Lord of Texcoco, with great pomp to bid us welcome to Cortez and to all of us, and one of our scouts came in to tell us that the large crowd of friendly Mexicans was coming along the road clad in rich mantles. It was very early in the morning when this happened, and we were ready to start, and Cortez ordered us to wait in our quarters until he could see what the matter was. At that moment four chieftains arrived, who made deep obeisance to Cortez and said that close by there was approaching Cacamatzin, the great lord of Texcoco, a nephew of the great Montezuma, and he begged us to have the goodness to wait until he arrived. He did not tarry long, for he soon arrived with greater pomp and splendor than we had ever beheld an American prince, for he came in a litter richly worked in green feathers, with many silver borderings and rich stones set in bosses made out of the finest gold. Eight chieftains, who it was said were all lords of towns bore the litter on their shoulders. When they came near to the house where Cortez was quartered, the chieftains assisted Cacamatzin to descend from the litter, and they swept the ground and removed the straws where he had to pass. And when they came before our captain, they made him a deep reverence. And Cacamatzin said, Malinche, here we have come, I and these chieftains, to place ourselves at your service, and to give you all that you may need for yourself and your companions, and to place you in your home, which is our city. For so the great Montezuma, our prince, has ordered us to do, and he asks your pardon that he did not come with us himself, but it is on account of ill health that he did not do so, and not from want of very good will which he bears towards you. When our captain heard and beheld such pomp and majesty in those chiefs, especially in the nephew of Montezuma, we considered a matter of the greatest importance, and said among ourselves, If this cacique bears himself with such dignity, what will the great Montezuma do? When Cacamatzin had delivered his speech, Cortez embraced him, and gave many caresses to him and all the other chieftains, and gave him three stones which are called margaritas, which have within them many markings of different colors, and to the other chieftains he gave blue glass beads, and he told them that he thanked them, and when he was able he would repay the Lord Montezuma for all the favors which every day he was granting us. As soon as the speech-making was over, we at once set out, and as the caciques whom I have spoken about brought many followers with them, and as many people came out to see us from the neighboring towns, all the roads were full of them. During the morning we arrived at a broad causeway, and continued our march towards Itzapalapa, and when we saw so many cities and villages built in the water, and other great towns on dry land, and that straight and level causeway going towards Mexico, we were amazed. 
and said that it was like the enchantments they tell of in the legend of Amadi, on account of the great towers and queues and buildings rising from the water and all built of masonry. And some of our soldiers even asked whether the things that we saw were not a dream. It is not to be wondered at that I here write it down in this manner, for there is so much to think over that I do not know how to describe it, seeing things as we did that had never been heard of or seen before, nor even dreamed about. Thus we arrived near Itza Palapa to behold the splendor of the other caciques who came out to meet us, who were the lords of the town named Quitluac and the lord of Culhuacan, both of them near relations to Montezuma. And then when we entered the city of Itza Palapa, the appearance of the palaces in which they lodged us, how spacious and well-built they were, of beautiful stonework and cedar wood, and the wood of other sweet-scented trees with great rooms and courts, wonderful to behold, covered with awnings of cotton cloth. When we had looked well at all of this, we went to the orchard and garden, which was a wonderful thing to see and walk in, such as I have never tired of looking at the diversity of the trees, and noting the scent which each one had, and the paths full of roses and flowers, and the many fruit trees and native roses, and the pond of fresh water. There was another thing to observe, that great canoes were able to pass into the garden from the lake through an opening that they had made, so that there was no need for their occupants to land. And all was cemented and very splendid with many kinds of stone monuments, with pictures on them which gave much to think about. Then the birds of many kinds and breeds which came into the pond. I say again that I stood looking at it and thought that never in the world would there be discovered over other lands such as these, for at that time there was no Peru, nor any thought of it. Of all these wonders that I then beheld today, all is overthrown and lost, nothing left standing. Let us go on, and I will relate that the caciques of that town and of Coyoacan brought us a present of gold worth more than two thousand pesos. Early next day we left Itzapalapa with a large escort of those great caciques whom I have already mentioned. We proceeded along the causeway, which is here eight paces in width, and run so straight to the city of Mexico that it does not seem to me to turn either much or little, but, broad as it is, it was so crowded with people that there was hardly any room for them all, some of them going to and others returning from Mexico, besides those who had come out to see us, so that we were hardly able to pass by the crowds of them that came, and the towers and queues were full of people as well as the canoes from all parts of the lake. It was not to be wondered at, for they had never before seen horses or men such as we are. Gazing on such wonderful sights, we did not know what to say, or that what appeared before us was real, for on one side on the lake there were great cities, and in the lake ever so many more, and the lake itself was crowded with canoes, and on the causeway were many bridges at intervals, and in front of us stood the great city of Mexico, and we, we did not even number four hundred soldiers. And we well remembered the words and warnings given us by the people of Huichotzingo and Tlaxcala, and the many other warnings that have been given that we should beware of entering Mexico, where they would kill us as soon as they had us inside. Let the curious readers consider whether there is not much to ponder over in this that I am writing. What men have there been in the world who have shown such daring? But let us get on and march along the causeway when we arrived where another small causeway branches off leading to Coyoacan, which is another city where there were some buildings like towers which are their oratories many more chieftains and caciques approach clad in very rich mantles the brilliant liveries of one chieftain differing from those of another and the causeways were crowded with them the great montezuma had sent these great caciques in advance to receive us and when they came before Cortes, they bade us welcome in their language, and as a sign of peace, they touched their hands against the ground and kissed the ground with the hand. There we halted for a good while, and Takamatsin, and Lord of Texcoco, and the Lord of Itzapalapa, and the Lord of Tocuba, and the Lord of Coyoacan, went on in advance to meet the great Montezuma, 
who was approaching in a rich litter accompanied by other great lords and caciques who owned vassals. When we arrived near to Mexico, where there were some other small towers, the great Montezuma got down from his litter, and those great caciques supported him with their arms beneath a marvelously rich canopy of green-colored feathers with much gold and silver embroidery, and with pearls in chalchuite suspended from a sort of bordering which was wonderful to look at. The great Montezuma was richly attired according to his usage, and he was shod with sandals. The soles were of gold, and the upper part adorned with precious stones. The four chieftains who supported his arms were also richly clothed according to their usage, in garments which were apparently held ready for them on the road to enable them to accompany their prince, for they did not appear in such attire when they came to receive us. Besides these four chieftains, there were four other great caciques who supported the canopy over their heads, and many other lords who walked before the great Montezuma, sweeping the ground where he would tread and spreading cloths on it, so that he should not tread on the earth. Not one of these chieftains dared even to think of looking him in the face, but kept their eyes lowered with great reverence, except those four relations, his nephews, who supported him with their arms. When Cortez was told that the great Montezuma was approaching, and he saw him coming, he dismounted from his horse, and when he was near Montezuma, they simultaneously paid great reverence to one another. Montezuma bade him welcome, and our Cortez replied through Doña Marina, wishing him very good health. And it seems to me that Cortez, through Doña Marina, offered him his right hand, and Montezuma did not wish to take it, but he did give his hand to Cortez, and then Cortez brought out a necklace which he had ready at hand, made of glass stones, which I have already said are called margaritas, which have within them many patterns of diverse colors. These were strung on a cord of gold and with musk, so that it should have a great sweet scent, and he placed it round the neck of Montezuma, and when he had so placed it, he was going to embrace him, and those great princes who accompanied Montezuma held back Cortez by the arm, so that he should not embrace him for they considered it an indignity. Then Cortez, through the mouth of Doña Marina, told him that now his heart rejoiced at having seen such a prince, and that he took it as a great honor that he had come in person to meet him, and had frequently shown him such favor. Then Montezuma spoke other words of politeness to him, and told two of his nephews who supported his arms, the Lord of Texcoco and the Lord of Coyoacan, to go with us and show us to our quarters, and Montezuma, with his other two relations, the Lord of Quiloac and the Lord of Tacuba, who accompanied him, returned to the city, and all those grand companies of caciques and chieftains who had come with him returned in his train. As they turned back after their prince, we stood watching them, and observed how well they marched with their eyes fixed on the ground without looking at him, keeping close to the wall, following him with great reverence. Thus space was made for us to enter the streets of Mexico without being so much crowded. But who could now count the multitude of men and women and boys who were in the streets and on the azoteas and in canoes and the canals who had come out to see us? It was indeed wonderful. And now that I am writing about it, it all comes before my eyes as though it had happened just yesterday. Coming to think it over, it seems to be a great mercy that our Lord Jesus Christ was pleased to give us grace and courage enough to dare to enter into such a city, and for the many times he has saved me from danger and death. As will be seen later on, I give him sincere thanks, and in that he has preserved me to write about it, although I cannot do it as fully as is fitting or the subject needs, let us make no words about it, for deeds are the best witnesses to what I say here and elsewhere. Let us return to our entry to Mexico. They took us to lodge in some large houses, where there were apartments for all of us, for they had belonged to the father of the great Montezuma, who was named Aishayaka, and at that time Montezuma kept there the great oratories for his idols, and a secret chamber where he kept bars and jewels of gold, which was the treasure that he had inherited from his father Aishayaka, and he never disturbed it. They took us to lodge in that house, because they called us Teuls, and took us for such so that we should be with the idols or tehuls which they kept there. However, for one reason or another, 
It was there they took us, where there were great halls and chambers canopied with the cloth of the country of our captain, and for every one of us, beds of matting. With canopies above, and no better bed is given, however great the chief may be, for they are not used. And all these palaces were coated with shining cement, and swept and garlanded. As soon as we arrived and entered into the great court, the great Montezuma took our captain by the hand, where he was there awaiting him, and led him to the apartment and salon where he was to lodge, which was very richly adorned according to their usage, and he had at hand a very rich necklace made of golden crabs, a marvelous piece of work, and Montezuma himself placed around the neck of our Captain Cortez, and greatly astonished his own captains by the great honor that he was bestowing on him. When the necklace had been fastened, Cortez thanked Montezuma through our interpreters, and Montezuma replied, Molinche, you and your brethren are in your own house. Rest a while. And then he went to his palaces, which were not far away, and we divided our lodgings by companies and placed the artillery pointing in a convenient direction, and the order which we had to keep was clearly explained to us, and that we were to be much on the alert, both the cavalry and all us soldiers. A sumptuous dinner was provided for us according to their use and custom, and we ate it at once. So this was our lucky and daring entry into the great city of Tenochtitlan, Mexico, on the eighth day of November, the year of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 1519. Thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ for it all. And if I have not said anything that I ought to have said, may your honors pardon me, for I do not know now, even at the present time, how better to express it. Let us leave this talk and go back to our story of what else happened to us, which I will go on to relate.